wanted to uh, pick up <clears throat> part two of our study of King Jehoshaphat, chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles. If you want to look at the Pew Bible, it's the 696. And here in chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat, he shows us how to face and overcome threats, personal threats, and in his case, a national threat. I find this chapter to be King Jehoshaphat's brightest moment as a king, as a leader, and as a follower of the Lord God. It's 30 verses, so it's too long for me to read to you today and then make application. So let me just summarize the narrative as I go along and we look at the best practices for overcoming threats this morning. It says in verse 1 of chapter 20, After this the Moabites and the Ammonites and some of the Minyanites came to war against Jehoshaphat. A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. And it is already at Hazion, Tamar. And this alarmed Jehoshaphat. The word alarmed means, first of all, the emotion of fear and dread and terror. That's how he felt. It is also including the mental, the mental anticipation of something very bad is going to happen. The mental anticipation of evil. I want you to remember something because that kind of surprises me that Jehoshaphat would feel this way. Because one of the first things Jehoshaphat did is he doubled his military forces when he became king. His dad, King Asa, had a good army, but Jehoshaphat doubled that army. And in chapter seven, 17 of 2 Chronicles, it says that he had 1,600 commanders of thousands. Now, there's some debate about how many thousands a commander would command, but if you look at the numbers in 2 Chronicles 17, you could easily total a million-man army. So Jehoshaphat had a serious military strength, but he is feeling terrified. He is alarmed. He is anticipating evil. That's the way he feels because not one, but three nations are coming to attack him. Three armies against one, and they're close. Hazion Tamar is about 30 miles away, about one day's march by troops from where he is in Jerusalem. So for him to feel alarmed and terrified and troubled by this impending massive military threat, they must have outnumbered him significantly. Whatever his army was, and it was big, they were so massive that he saw no hope whatsoever. I don't know. I can't really relate to him in that moment because I've never been like that. I've only had one incidence in my life where somebody threatened to bodily harm me. <laughs> and that man was drunk and he wasn't armed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and he came to my front door to do it. Um, so, and, and I didn't serve in the military, so, so I don't know really what it's like to feel that kind of terror and that kind of alarm, but that's the way he felt, and perhaps maybe you have had some personal experiences where you, you would say, I know exactly how he felt because I have been threatened like that as well. Now, at the very end of the message, in point number two, I am going to share with you what alarms me in our world today. What is it that I am most afraid of as a Christian and as a pastor? So we'll get to that at the end. But I want to go through now the best practices that King Jehoshaphat brings to the table in the face of this national threat. The first thing he does is that he seeks the Lord, not himself alone, but he includes all of his people. So alarmed, what does Jehoshaphat do? He resolves to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaims a fast for all Judah. 
And the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So there, imagine, thousands of people have gathered at the temple in Jerusalem and they are standing before Jehoshaphat, their king, and before the Lord God. And it says there were men there, there were women there, there were children, and there were infants, there were babies. Whole families came. And what does that mean? They stopped their normal routines. They took the day off from work. And it says he called a fast, so they stopped eating. Did the babies fast? I don't know. But mom and dad did. Why? Because nothing else mattered. Work didn't matter. Food didn't matter. What mattered is that we need to call out to God because in about a day, we're going to get annihilated by these three armies that are coming against us. And so he, standing for this, this humbled uh, congregation of people, and again, fasting is to indicate their urgent distress and their desire to cry out to God with their need because their very life is threatened. And he leads them in a very wonderful prayer. Let me read to you what he prays here in Second Chronicles 20. He says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kings of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. I mean, God is sovereign. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to them forever, to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Did you do that? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name. And they believe that if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, that we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and you will save us. That was the whole purpose of the temple. We're going to cry out to you. We're your people and you're going to save us. And then the problem. But now here are men from Ammon and Moabite, Moab and Mount Seir whose territory... Remember, you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. We had our chance, God, to take care of these people, but you didn't let us. See how they are repairing us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? Our God. Will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. What a way to end the prayer. God, are you going to judge them? Because we don't have it. We don't have it. We don't know what to do. This is a king, a good king, in front of his people declaring, God, <laughs> we don't have it. I believe that he has already met with his war room. I believe they have played out every possible human scenario. Three armies against one. If we do this, they do that. And in every single possible scenario for war, they're, they don't see the win. No matter what we do, we're done. No matter what we do, we're done. And so he admits before the Lord God that he is confused, that he's full of fear, and he's out of options. And that's number two. This is the kind of humility and the kind of dependence that we get to when we have looked at our human strategies, when we have looked at our options and we've said, you know what, God? I don't see it. And so I'm going to look to you. Psalms 121, right? I will look unto the hills from whence comes my help. Didn't come from the hills. Right? Horizontal help isn't there. Human help is not there. My help comes from who? The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's what that psalm is about. He's looked for help all around. He's looked above. But then at the end, at the bottom of the barrel, we say, the only place is to look up. And that's what Jehoshaphat leads his people to do. 
We are at the bottom. We are completely out of options. And so we must look only to our Lord God. It's a wonderful practice that he is giving us. That when we're out of human options, that's what we need to do. We need to confess our lack and look to him for help. And so then they waited. They waited. Verse 13, all Judah stood. They were standing. They weren't sitting. They weren't under the umbrellas or in the picnic tables or, you know, on the, the blankets on the ground. They were standing before the Lord with their little ones, their infants, with their wives and their children. Imagine that scene. When's the last time you stood for an hour? I did last Saturday. Our family reunion, we had a tour at the Capitol. We all met in the rotunda. Well, our group got there 15, 30 minutes early. There's no place to sit in the rotunda. So we're just milling around there, and 15 minutes go, 30 minutes back. So finally, 1.30 comes, and that's when our tour guide's coming, and we're already tired of standing. And then, of course, some of my family are late. So another 15 minutes before the tour starts, and man, my back is barking by then. <laughs> you know, enough of this, okay? You know, it's hard to stand, even for a little while, but they stood until the Lord answered. And we're not told how long they stood, but they stood waiting for God to answer them in their complete uh, optionalist situation. Then it says, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, some guy in the audience, and he stands out and he says, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. <laughs> Easy to say that, right? Oh, don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Yeah, right. Uh, those are easy words to say, but, but he said this. Do that because the battle is not yours but God's. You know, I had the pleasure, and this church had the pleasure of being sued in 1998 because we had a fight in our youth group. And we were sued for $450,000. I was named... So was every other volunteer there that night. And me, they put on me 100,000 punitive damage. And insurance companies do not cover punitive damages. So I'm going to lose my house, folks. You think I wasn't afraid? It was so nice to call the insurance company and meet with their attorney. And he said, we'll take care of it for you. We'll fight. We'll fight this for you. He said, it'll take a year, it'll stress you out, but, but we'll fight for you. Isn't that a wonderful feeling? <laughs> to know you've got an insurance company that's going to take care of you when you need it, and it did. It took a whole year, and it got resolved, settled out of court, and uh, came out a lot better than we had ever hoped. Amazing. But that's what they do. And, those are wonderful words. I don't know if you had that experience of somebody else summoned and said, you know what, come on, I'll fight for you. It's not yours. It's mine. And that's what God is saying to them through the prophet. This is not your battle. This is my battle, and I'm going to take care of it. Just watch and see. And so the prophet gives the specific location of this massive army that's coming. They are coming around the Dead Sea, and they're now going up these gorges that come up into the plateau leading toward Jerusalem. And so they've got to go through this place. It's a very specific place. And he says, okay, that's where they're going to be tomorrow. And I want you to go to the plateau to, that is commonly looked as a lookout so you can see down in the gorge. And you're going to see God take care of your enemies for you. Verse 17, you will not have to fight in this battle. Oh, that's a relief. But you will have to take up your position you will have to stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord that the Lord will give you. So, again, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Those words are repeated. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. How many of you would do that? <laughs> but that's what he said. You're not going to have to fight, but you've got to go. You've got to go. You've got to walk 30 miles, and you've got to face them tomorrow. And they did. They did trust the word of the prophet, and they did obey God's instructions through the prophet. And it says in the next verse, early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa, 
And as they set up, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Folks, this is Jehoshaphat at his best. As a king and as a leader, he's up early. He's ready to go. He says, folks, I'm going. Are you with me? we got to have faith in God. And you know what? In the Bible, faith is never an emotion. Faith is never an intellectual thing. It is always an act. It is a verb, right? Faith without works is dead, right? Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the conviction of things, what? Not seen. It is moving out in faith, acting. This breakfast, the cooks were here early. This was an act of faith, right? What if nobody comes? No, they cook believing that people would come. And people came. We prayed for you. We knew you were coming. Peter, come and walk on the water, right? Well, I have faith. No, get out of the boat. That's what faith is. And that's what faith these people were called to do. They had to get up early. They had to walk the 30 miles to the lookout point and see the deliverance of the Lord God. They wouldn't have seen it had they not got up and made the walk 30 miles, dressed and ready to go. Then something happens. As they began to sing in praise. Don't lose that verse. As they began to sing in praise, as they are walking this 30 miles. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Seir. And the Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men of Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. Oh. And after they finished slaughtering the men of Seir, they helped destroy one another. <laughs> Can God do that? Three armies? Somehow? Two armies decided they didn't like the third one, and they wiped them out, and then they wiped each other out. Amazing. As they began to sing in praise, God set the ambushes, turned them against one another. Who knows over what? But the fight got started, you know, like in a bar. Who started the fight? Everything, all of a sudden, the whole place is in a <laughs> thing. I haven't been in a bar fight ever, but... Uh, I, just, I just see that kind of stuff on TV, right? But they praised and they sang and God began to work. Linda, uh, one of our members on Thursday, the women's luncheon, invited me, the sole male there, to have lunch with them. And she shared with the whole group a time when her husband was unemployed and the state of California was not hiring. But she says... Every day I praise God for the job my husband was going to have. And in two weeks later, the state called him and said, we're hiring you. <laughs> she praised God every day for the job her husband was going to get. I love that. Thank you, because that's what's going on here. As they sang in praise, God began to do his work. And so when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooked that desert, they got to the spot and they looked down that, that gully toward the vast army and they saw what? Only dead bodies lying on the ground. Not one person had escaped. Can you imagine how many people that was? Every soldier was dead. Imagine that sight. We got here. And God already had fought the battle and won, and all that was left was nothing. It took them three days to strip all the plunder. Three days. There was so much stuff. On the fourth day, they gathered at the Valley of Baraka, and they praised the Lord. So you praise before and you praise afterwards. And then they went to Jerusalem, and they sang and they praised and they marched in with trumpets and all the other musical instruments and they gave God the praise because God did what he said, I'm going to fight the battle for you. So praise God not just afterwards, which is our typical pattern, right? 
It's after the fact we praise. No, they praise God on the way. And then after it was over, they praised God again. Wonderful, wonderful practice there. So just to summarize, best practices, seek the Lord. We're going to do that at Holy Communion today. That's my theme here. Use this table to seek the Lord. Acknowledge your feelings of, and your lack of resources, your lack of options. The hardest part is wait for God to answer. Wait for God to answer. Don't find that easy. And then act. Obey in faith. Whatever he tells you to do, we've got to do it. And then praise the Lord. Praise him before, praise him during, and praise him after. And see what God will do for you. And I have just a few minutes because I want to keep my promise to you about what causes me the greatest amount of fear in my life today. And that is radical Islam terrorism. And I don't want these words that I'm going to say in the next five minutes to be interpreted as fear-mongering. I don't want to be accused of xenophobia. I don't want to be accused of being a bigot or involved in hate speech. But here are some facts. There are 2.4 billion Christians in our world. There are 1.6, maybe 1.9 billion Muslims in our world. 23% of the global population. 40 nations have a Muslim majority. Right now in America, 3.3 million Muslims in America. 39,000 Muslim refugees entered in 2016. California, 1% of our population of 39 million is Muslim. And there are 75,000 Muslims in Sacramento. I think I found that in the Sacramento Bee in an article not long ago. Um, so Islam is the second largest religion in the world following Christianity, but it is today the fastest growing religion. And by 2050, uh, Muslims will outnumber Christians in the world. I'm a little concerned by that. They do a better job in discipling their children than we do. That concerns me. So, let me just say to you that Islam is both a threat, and we'll talk about that in a second, and a ministry opportunity. Great articles in Christianity today that I happen to find, uh, these quotes, and I agree with them, that we don't want to be naive and pretend that terrorism isn't a problem, but we don't want to be an alarmist and assume that all Muslims are terrorists. Hear me, all Muslims are not terrorists. All Muslims are not terrorists. We know we have terrorism, but all Muslims are not terrorists. David Cashin, intercultural studies professor, says, this is the best chance we've had in human history to share the love of Christ with Muslims. Why is that? Well, because they're in our neighborhood. I was at McDonald's yesterday afternoon, and you see a, a woman with a burqa on walking her stroller with her little children. There are 75,000 Muslims in Sacramento. Some of them may be living on your street, right? They're in your town. Maybe you ought to whisper a prayer for one when you see them. Maybe you ought to try to become acquainted with them. I don't know a Muslim by name right now, but I'm sure that day is coming. But let's think about the opportunity we have because many of them have been victims of terrorism. 55% are opposed to the use of Sharia law, that is the majority, and 80 2% of Muslims in Arab countries are comfortable with non-Muslim neighbors. And since 9-11, Muslims have been converting to Christianity at an incredible rate. There is a revival, I understand, going on in Iran itself. More and more Muslims are saying, this is not my religion. I'm ready for a change. And Christianity is there. So it's happening. There's a great opportunity David Cashin said, this is a moment Christian missionaries to the Muslim world have dreamed about for centuries. He says, don't miss the moment. So you can't treat every Muslim as a terrorist. Please don't think that way because it's, it's inaccurate. But see an opportunity to share the love of Christ with them. Because if they don't get it from us, who are they going to get it from? So I urge you to pray for the Muslim population. Try to Put that in your prayer list that you think about the worldwide Muslims and pray and if you have an opportunity to show them the love of Christ. Again, we are the only Bible they will read is our own 
love. So that's the ministry opportunity. The world has come to us. Secondly, it is a threat. Because out of the 1.6 billion global Muslims, it is estimated between 5 and 20 percent are radicalized jihadis. And I saw several different resources. The most conservative estimate is 5 percent, all the way to 20 percent of 1.99 billion or 1.6 billion. That's a whole lot of potential terrorists. That's a whole lot of potential terrorists. 75,000 to 300 and 75 million to 375 million potential terrorists in our world today based on those numbers alone. That's a whole lot of potential terrorists out there, folks. And that what bothers me. They practice jihad. It is the sixth and unofficial pillar of Islam. There are five pillars of Islam. I won't go into those. But number six is jihad. You can wage jihad, which means holy war or spiritual fight, by, by word, by talking about Islam, by good deeds, by practicing the Islam faith, or by the sword, by killing non-Muslims in an act of terrorism. And so there is that group that has decided to wage war against the West, and they have chosen jihad by sword and any other method they might kill non-Muslims by. So far today, there have been 28,348 deadly terrorist attacks since 9-11, and this year alone, 617 terrorist attacks. Britain, four in four months, right? You've seen them on the news, four in four months. Shootings, stabbings, self-inflicted bombs, and so forth. This is the greatest global threat that I can see, is the radical jihadis. How do we stand firm against this violent threat of radical jihad? I think we need to follow Jehoshaphat. I think we need to be fasting and praying about that particular population. I think we need to pray specifically that God would do to their ranks as he did to the Moabites and the Mount Seir guys and the Ammonites that he would turn them against each other, that he would confuse them, that he would cause civil war amongst them, and that they would self-destruct. Here's an interesting thing. After I prepared this sermon on Monday, Tuesday morning, I was having devotions in the In Touch magazine. You know, we have it. You have it. So I read my devotion, and it led me to a scripture passage, and somehow, somehow, and I, this is the, the God part of this whole sermon, is is that I found Psalm 83. And it wasn't part of the lesson, but somehow Psalms 83 was before my eyes. And as I read it, it is a prayer to do exactly that to Israel's enemies. It starts here. See how our enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. Israel is surrounded by people who want them gone. With one mind, they plot together. They form an alliance against you from the tents of Edom, the same group, and the Ishmaelites. Again, you know who that is. And the Hagarites and Babylon and Ammonites and the Malachites and the Philistines. Verse 9, do to them as you did to Midian. Remember when Gideon was there, he had his 300 men, and they cracked the pot, and they shouted out for the Lord and for Gideon, and the people down there went into confusion, and they slaughtered each other. This is a prayer to pray about our enemies and say, God, take care of them, confuse them, cause them to destroy one another. Psalms 83 is your pattern right there. I just felt like God showed me that and said, okay, that's confirmation that that's an okay way to pray about that particular population, that particular population who will kill you because you're a Christian or a Jew or a non-person like them. That's what we want to pray against. 
I don't think that's out of line biblically. So pray. Use Psalm 83 as an example in that regard today. Sobering stuff, but just felt led to use this particular text to talk about that because we are facing a global threat from that particular population. And I don't think we need to be naive and say it's not there because it is there. Lord, we pause for these sobering words and yet they're encouraging to us because, Lord, ultimately with your people, you said, you know, this battle is not yours but mine. Thank you that that's in the Bible. That this is not our battle but it is yours and you're sovereign. But you do show us that it is appropriate to pray and when your people are outnumbered and we're out of resources and we're out of of any kind of, uh, of, of, of direction, we pray, Lord God, that you would intervene and confuse and cause the self-destruction of your enemies. Lord, if you did it for Jehoshaphat, if you did it for Gideon, you can do it for us. In Jesus' name.